Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Lee Briggs. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Matt. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about specifically Sensu 1.x and Kubernetes and how the two can coexist. Um, before I get started, a, quick, a brief introduction. Um, I am based in Seattle now. Uh, I was formerly um, living in London, and my, or I'm originally from Yorkshire in the north of England. Um, I like to bring that up at conferences now because um, the only thing that's good about where I came from is that Bill Bryson wrote that the, the British Army should use it for target practice. So um, it's something that I tell people when I moved here, and they, they always get a kick out of that. Um, I work for a company called Aptio based in Bellevue. Um, and we are hiring uh, if anybody is interested in transitioning into another role. Um, Aptio deals with IT cost analytics. Um, and so we generally um, save companies money. Um, and if you want to stalk me around the internet, um, I have a GitHub account, a Twitter account, and a blog, which I'm proud to say I have written on this year instead of, <laughs> instead of composing a series of tweets and then putting them all together. Um, so. Um, that's my little, uh, little rant. Um, if, you, if you're going to use more than five tweets, please write a blog post. Um, um, so in terms of my background with Kubernetes and Sensu and Aptio's background with Kubernetes and Sensu, uh, we've been using Sensu since 2012. Um, we have um, over 7,000 clients in, in dev and prod. I've heard a couple of people like mention Nagios in like a, 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 a a discerning way. Uh, when I started Aptio, we used a monitoring system called Zymon. And then we moved to another monitoring system called OpenNMS. And these are screenshots of them. So the next time somebody complains about uh, Nagios, I'm going to show them this again. It was awful. Um, uh, we transitioned to Sensu as we moved some of our workloads into Amazon and into the cloud. Um, it made sense at the time because obviously it was the only monitoring system that we were familiar with that actually had any concept of ephemeral. Um, so um, around about 2016, we kind of went down the containers route. Um, we stupidly tried to run Kubernetes 1.0, um, and it didn't really work, but we persisted. Um, and we now have several regions, several different environments, several different cloud providers. We have physical data center clusters and uh, AWS-based clusters. Um, the, uh, one of the things that um, we have found that's difficult about Kubernetes is actually configuration management for the cluster, uh, which uh, you know, when, we're, when we're talking tomorrow, I'd love to talk to people about that because this is an ongoing problem. Um, but we run a hybrid monitoring stack now. Um, we have Prometheus for a lot of our container-based workloads, and we use Sensu for all of our other workloads. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what those workloads are um, uh, a little later on. So I'll skip through these awful uh, um, screenshots again. Um, the, the target audience for this talk is generally supposed to be you're running Sensu already, you um, have maybe have a cloud footprint, you maybe have physical data centers, you are used to the concept of ephemeral, that like you can delete clients from Sensu, and you might just be starting to investigate what a container-based workload or an orchestration system looks like. Um, I would strongly recommend Kubernetes. Um, there are other things out there, Nomad, um, Mesos, all these other um, lesser, um, in my opinion, uh, container orchestration tools. Um, so the, the main thing that I would want to talk about is something that we at Aptio went through in that we had already had a fully baked, well set up monitoring system, and we knew we would need something else in the, eventually, but we didn't want to rip it all out and start from scratch. Uh, the final thing before I begin, a lot of the concepts in this talk have been shamelessly stolen from Tom Wilkie at Grafanacon. Um, he did an absolutely fantastic part, uh, talk um, which kind of formalized a lot of the concepts that I'm talking about here. Um, so I would highly recommend as an additional reading that, you know, go and have a look at that uh, blog post. It's really, really good. So um, a quick rundown of what I will call monitoring models. Um, when you start out with monitoring, if you use Nagios or use any of the other traditional things like Zabbix or Zymon or whatever, uh, you're probably thinking about host-based monitoring. Um, you are thinking about machines, even uh, virtual machines. You're thinking about the metrics on the machines and the disks healthy, relatively static components, things that don't really move that much. And for a long time in Aptio, that was fine for us because a lot of our workload was actually host-based. We installed applications onto hosts, and then we had to monitor those hosts to make sure they were healthy. 
And the, the formalized concept that we didn't really realize we knew at the time is this concept of the use method uh, of monitoring, uh, popularized by a very, very intelligent uh, fellow, Brendan Gregg. Um, and essentially what you're saying is that on those um, hosts, those resources, you want to monitor these three things at a minimum. Utilization, the saturation of those, of those resources, and the number of errors. And that's really easy to do with Sensu Wanda X. You're basically writing check scripts to monitor those things. Um, it can be hard to do it on some things. Memory is a great example of this. I, 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 I bet if, raise your hand if you had a memory check and you turned it off. Yeah because people were just getting paged for no reason. Memory's there to be used. Like, there's no point in actually monitoring the utilization of memory because it's there to be consumed. Um, so this, this use method works for the host-based system, but it doesn't always work when you're talking about things that, that maybe move and then maybe more ephemeral. Um, the other thing about Sensu Wonder X is that in order to make use of these utilization and these saturation things, you have to define an arbitrary endpoint of this is the maximum that I want to use. And with a check script, you usually see, if you look at most of the check, tips, you, ch check scripts, you will have a critical threshold and a warning threshold. And that makes it really hard when you start to do other kinds of monitoring, especially when you go towards container-based workloads. So when you into container-based workloads, you, you're more talking about service-based monitoring. You have something running, and the hosts underneath it no longer matter. They may come, they may go, they may get healthy, they may be unhealthy, you may delete them, you may terminate them. Um, the, the main thing that you care about is the actual user experience of that service, whether it's an external user or an external user. Um, with, with things like um, cloud platforms, you, you start to transition from this host-based model into this service-based model, and you think about something very, very simple like an Amazon ELB. That is monitoring the health of your service, and it will remove things if it's not healthy so that the service stays active. Um, monitoring these kind of stuff with Sensu can be a little bit tricky. Um, and monitoring this stuff with things like Nagios is next to impossible because what you have to do is point it at, point a monitoring system that is a concept of hosts and then point it at a service, and it no longer understands what this thing is. Um, some of the examples of these kind of monitoring systems are Prometheus. Um, we have the tick stack, um, which is very heavily into this kind of service-based monitoring. Obviously, it can do host-based monitoring as well. Prometheus can do that. Um, but they are designed in a completely different way. Um, and my understanding from what I've seen of Sensu 2.0 is that it is more focused on this um, service-based monitoring as well, but there is still the traditional host-based monitoring there. So if you are in a service-based um, monitoring model, uh, there's a couple of models that you can use. Uh, and Tom Wilkie from Grafana um, came up with this idea of the red method, um, where instead of monitoring the utilization and the saturation and all those kind of things, now you want to see the number of requests, the rate of requests per second to that service, uh, the number of errors that, that are actually failing in those requests, and the amount of time it takes. And that will give you a much, much better idea of the health of your service because it's, if you think about when you go to some of the larger websites, there could be a complete tire fire underneath, but as long as the actual, if your Facebook page reloads and you can still see those cat pictures, you're probably not going to complain too much. Um, and then finally, um, the other thing to think about with the service-based monitoring, and if you haven't read the Google SRE book, even if you're a developer or an administrator, I highly recommend taking some time on the bus in the morning or on the way home to, to read through it. But one thing that really stood out to me is these four golden rules of monitoring. Um, and for each of these services that you deploy, um, you would monitor the latency, uh, the traffic, so how much demand, uh, errors, and saturation. And you can see the overlap there between the red method and the four golden rules. They are very similar. Um, but it really is kind of, it, it really does change the way you think about things if you're no longer monitoring hosts, but you're monitoring actual services. So this talk is about Kubernetes, so I'll talk a little bit about Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes really needs you to have service-based monitoring in order for it to be successful. You cannot monitor the hosts in Kubernetes. If you deploy a Kubernetes stack in GKE, it will automatically give you a node group that will change and scale. You don't want to be monitoring those as they come and go because it's just going to cause you noise, it's going to cause you pain, it's going to cause you headaches. Um, and if you think about, if you are familiar with Kubernetes at all, 
even the containers will move and they will be rescheduled in, in different parts of the, the cluster and the pods will, will come and go. They don't even, unless you're using stateful sets, they don't even have names that you could particularly use. And if you think about how that works with Sensu, um, you know, it is, it is host-based. It relies you to have either a host or a source component um, to actually identify the alert. Um, Metric-based monitoring with Kubernetes is highly desirable. If you go back to those red and uh, foregone rules, they are all based on metrics and, and how you would measure them. Um, <clears throat> and underneath all this, it, unless you are lucky enough to use one of the managed services, Kubernetes is still running on hosts. It, the hosts still exist. You might not be managing them, you might be, but you still need to monitor those hosts too. They haven't gone away. Um, you know, I've been to a couple conferences now. I, I went to PuppetConf last year, and there was a question, um, do you see Puppet like, having a future in a container-based environment? And the, the obvious answer is, well, how are you going to install Docker? It doesn't just come by default. You still have to get it on there and configure it. Um, so whether you push that over to the cloud provider or you work in an enterprise IT stack like I do and you're not allowed to use those components, you still have to do it yourself. Um, you still have to monitor those things, and the use method still applies there. So. You're an enterprise, you're transitioning to containers, you're thinking about using Kubernetes, you have a traditional host-based stack, um, what, what do you do? Well, the last thing you do is put everything in containers. It's, it's, it takes time, you have to go through the process. Generally, the way we did it is you find one application and you think this looks good for containers and you move that into containers. Um, and you already have an awesome monitoring solution. Sensu is already in your enterprise, I would imagine, if you sat here at this conference. You probably, want to you probably don't want to move things into containers and then not monitor it at all. So while you're going through this transitioning period, you can still utilize and leverage Sensu 1.x where you need to. Um, you don't want to throw away all that work. You know, you've, you've worn many battle scars fighting Rabbit MQ in the middle of the night, and you probably don't want to give that up too easily. Um, so you still want to keep going and, and using some of these things. The real, the real thing that I've added here as well is that the hard truth is even if you are an Amazon-based, um, you know, an Amazon-based company, uh, I was talking with Kelsey last night. You know, Google didn't even have the concept of virtual machines, and they were like, "Why is every, why does, why do people need them?" The reason for that is because most enterprises are lifting all their stuff out of data centers and putting it in in EC2 instances, and um, the reason they're doing that is for capacity. Um, it's a lot easier to ask Amazon for 100 EC2 instances than it is to rack 100 servers. And we see this at Aptio all the time. This is our job. We look, at the, um, we look at the utilization in a company and we say, okay, you moved everything to Amazon and you don't understand why it's more expensive. Well, it's because you're paying twice as much for things. Um, it's, it's a fairly simple thing. So these, these transitions to containers is going to take time. So your Sensu 1.8 stack might be, a lot, uh, might be around for quite a while. You have to find a middle ground. Um, there are a couple of tricks that you can use to make Sensu a little bit more service-based. Um, one of the things that we utilized heavily was the source attribute. I remember there was a pull request open for this for a long, long time. Uh, client masquerading, I think it was called at the time. And it, it was a real, real game changer for the way Sensu was used because it meant that you no longer had to have this uh, metadata, which was the host name of the, of the thing that was, you were monitoring. Um, and it really made distributed monitoring really easy. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in a couple minutes. And then when they added the API and allowed you to um, you know, post checks to the API, that was a really big game changer um, for the host-based monitoring, the cloud-based monitoring stuff. Um, as I mentioned, though, a lot of the Kubernetes components do remain static. Uh, the number of replicas is probably not going to change that much unless you have got really, really fancy and you're using vertical and horizontal autoscalers. Um, so you want to make sure that the number of replicas is met um, and you want to monitor those things. What's nice about Kubernetes is it will fix the problem for you, but as an operator, you probably want to know something happened. So you might not necessarily page yourself for it, but you would want to get that information that a pod died and, it, and another replica was stood up. Why did it die? Go and investigate the problem later. Um, the control plane you know, is relatively static. The Kubernetes API server, the uh, controller manager, and the scheduler, those things need to be healthy, and you need to know that they're working. Um, and then, of course, the thing that's the most static is your application and its health. That is, always needs to be OK. So you need to monitor that. And Sensu can really, really help you with this. So 
running Sensu on Kubernetes itself. If you are planning on using Sensu 1.x with Kubernetes, I would highly recommend running all of the Sensu components that you can inside Kubernetes. Um, we use the Redis operator and we use a Redis transport because RabbitMQ. Um, and uh, this is not in our, phys in our physical infrastructure. We use RabbitMQ and console to do service discovery based um, uh, health checks. Um, but we, we think about Sensu as like, little, like a bundled application stack. So each data center has a uh, Sensu stack and each Kubernetes cluster also has a little Sensu stack running inside it. Um, if there was a RabbitMQ operator, um, then we would uh, consider using it. Um, for those that aren't aware, an operator is something that makes running a stateful application in Kubernetes much, much easier. It allows you to, to transition some of the things that you would do in the application, like uh, failovers and all that kind of stuff, into a Kubernetes API, um, which is really nice for Redis, because it means that we can simply declare um, a Redis cluster, and it does all of the job of creating the master, the sentinels, and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really nice. Um, and then the rest of the components, because Sensu is essentially um, a very, very simple uh, application that connects to a transport, we just run them as standard deployments. Um, the API server is a separate deployment, the server is a separate deployment, and then we have the client, which runs as a daemon set on every host, um, and then we also run it as sidecar containers alongside applications. Um, I put all this um, stuff in an example repo. I'm going to quickly go through it um, now. Um, but this, these two are basically a, a Docker container based on the Docker Sensu container, um, but it includes a bunch of Kubernetes-specific stuff, and I made a few modifications. Um, and then there is a repo that has the deployment manifests uh, for Sensu on Kubernetes. So I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, I actually had a lot more in this talk, and then I cut it down. And then I found out that we were overrunning, and I felt like I could have added it all back in, but uh, I didn't do that. So uh, is that large enough for everybody? Can everybody see that? A little bigger. Better? Yes? No? OK. So we have uh, my Kubernetes cluster in GKE. Uh, thanks for that $300 free credit, credit guys. That's really useful. Um, and um, I must have abused that so many times. Now I have about 20 different Google email addresses. Um, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that way Kelsey sat there. You can make it higher. That'd be better. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we obviously have a bunch of nodes there, and it's running the GKE version, um, and it's in, a, in an auto-scaling group, as, as you mentioned, as I mentioned before. Um, and I've configured this cluster with a bunch of extra goodies, like the cert manager and external DNS. So deployments are really, really easy, and this is just a list of all the namespaces. You can also see that I've deployed the Weaveworks microservices demo sock shop into this cluster to show you an example of how you monitor a traditional, a more microservices based application. Um, and then in the default namespace, let me just make that bigger. You can see here's my Sensu stack. So you can see I have a Redis operator running, which controls the actual Redis components. Um, and then I have a bunch of failovers. Um, and one of these is a master. So I can delete those to my heart's content. And the operator will recover it for me. So I should, theoretically, I should have tested this. But I should not have lost any of uh, my data. Um, you can also see I have the, the client, which is running as a daemon set. So you can see here um, that then there is a node on its way up, or it should be on its way up. So it's running on all of those uh, Kubernetes nodes. Uh, and then we have an API and a server. And I'll just quickly show you the logs. You can see it's just a standard, standard Sensu API log messages. What's really nice about this Kubernetes stuff is that if I want to scale this, and I want to add more Sensu API servers, let's say as I add more nodes, um, I can simply just scale the deployment, and I have another API server. And that's the same with the server stuff as well. So if you have a lot of clients, as this grows, if you think about what you have to do now, you have to have a new EC2 instance or a new virtual machine, and then you have to run Puppet or Chef or something like that, and then add it to your load balancer. Kubernetes takes care of all that for you. Um, and to be quite honest, I, I 
probably wouldn't want to go through the hassle of um, doing it all in a host-based way. Uh, as I said, RabbitMQ lives outside the cluster, but all of the actual other components run inside, sense, uh, run inside Kubernetes now. Um, we also obviously have Uchua, um, so I'll quickly hop over to that, and I'll give you a quick show of what's going on here. I didn't lose all my data, yay. Um, and I only know that because that's from an hour ago. Um, so I have my GKA data, data center in here, uh, and you can see there's a bunch of nodes. Um, and there's also the Sensu clients. Um, the, um, the way that we handle that is we just turn on the deregistration handler. So if I delete one of these nodes, uh, or I delete all these nodes, So I can delete all of the daemon set. I've been doing a lot of deletions. I could delete all my clients, and they all, they'll all disappear, but they get recreated, and the nodes vanish. Um, so the deregistration works exactly the same as it would in any traditional cloud provider. And you'll also notice that my applications are still being monitored uh, because they're actually sidecar containers, and I'll show you that in a minute. So my clients are back now, and I'm continuing to monitoring them. Um, you'll also notice that we have this GKE API server uh, that's, got, that's just using the source attribute. Um, and you can see I'm, I've bundled all of the Kubernetes um, plugins that come in the Sensu Gems, Sensu plugins Kubernetes. So you can see I'm checking that all services are reporting as up, all pods are running and they're within their threshold. Check the pods are ready. I'm doing check nodes ready, um, which is probably not really required because GKA is taking care of this for me. But in most other like, physical data centers, you might want to have that um, to make sure that um, you know, if, if the Kubernetes component die and all that kind of stuff, it's a nice way of actually knowing, hey, my server might be up, but Docker's dead or the kubelet's dead or something like that. Um, and these are all re reporting fine. So the actual application itself is Sorry. Apparently, I'm no good with this uh, full screen stuff. There we so you can see here, there's the sock shop. And this is a very, very long YAML file with the full deployment of the sock shop. But what I will do is quickly jump to at the top here, you can see I've got configuration data for Sensu itself, and then I can look at the Sensu client. With Kubernetes, you can basically have side, these sidecar containers, so a pod doesn't necessarily have um, one container in it, and they share an uh, IP address. So that means that my Sensu client is bundled alongside my catalog service here, um, and you can see I just mount some JSON into um, the check path here, and up at the top, you can see here's my definition for my service check, just as JSON. I try to, th we, we, I try to think of some ways um, to make this a little bit more elaborate, uh, like, my, like generating JSON on the fly and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, it's just easier to just pipe it into the conf config map like that. Um, so because the um, sock shop um, application, they all expose a health endpoint, I don't need to say anything different um, for the actual command. I just wrote a little Ruby script that checks the command, and we're good to go. And then the final thing is that I specify an environment variable as part of the Sensu daemon, which specifies what the client name is. So now, I don't, whenever I add a new service, I'll actually get an alert for that particular service. And you can see that when you actually go in here. Here's my order service. And here's my payment service, and then here's my catalog service, which are all just components of the um, of the uh, the sock shop stuff. Um, you get a keep alive check for free, as you do with all other um, all other um, Sensu clients. Uh, but essentially, this is just the service running, and it's it's perfectly healthy. And this is the use method for service-based monitoring. Um, and it's it's that flexibility that Sensu 1.x gives you that allows you to do this kind of stuff. So, 
Is this all you can do? Absolutely not. Uh, and there are smarter people than me that have written extensive blog posts about the kind of stuff. We've heard already today multiple times how Sensu can work together with Prometheus. And if you are going down the container-based workload route, you are probably going to look at something like Prometheus in the future. You might look at Sensu 2.x, but you're probably going to at least evaluate uh, Prometheus. And Sensu being so flexible and being the monitoring router um, is, uh, you know, allows you to kind of mold these things together. There's a great uh, blog on the Sensu Prometheus collector, uh, and obviously Sean's mentioned it already today. Um, so as you go further into this journey, you can start to, to mash these two things together. Um, there is also a Sensu operator. Um, I haven't personally tried it. I figured it was overkill because there's so little state in Sensu's components already. Um, that we figured it wasn't worth it. Um, what is great about that operator is it means that you can then define checks with the Kubernetes API, which is really, really nice. Um, and you know, something that you might consider, it's, it looks relatively easy to deploy. Um, obviously, Sensu 2.0 uh, has Kubernetes deployment manifest there, so you know, give that a try as well. Um, and then uh, I only kind of came across this actually this morning, but there was a great blog post um, on a very a much more in-depth uh, Kubernetes and Sensu um, kind of integration with Prometheus, and I actually thought that guy should have been doing this talk, so I don't know where he is. If he's in the room, he should, you know, thank you very much. Um, but you know, these are all additional things that you can add um, as well. So in summary, um, this, actually does, uh, this, this is actually a summary for my longer slide deck, so it might not make a lot of sense, so I'm gonna kind of add a bunch of stuff at the end here. But at Aptio, we went through an infrastructure journey. We went from traditional physical data centers, we went to in EC2 and, and virtual machines, and then we went to um, container-based workloads. Your monitoring is going to go on that same journey. And for us, Sensu allowed us to transition between all of those stages. It allowed us to transition from hosts into EC2 instances, and then it's also helping us transition into containers as well. Uh, we're very excited about Sensu2. Uh, we're really, really hoping to, to, to see what we can do with that. Um, we haven't had time to evaluate it just yet, um, but we are very excited about it and keeping on top of things. Um, but the main thing that I think um, is, is important to note is the flexibility that Sensu provides us is um, is invaluable in our monitoring journey. It's been invaluable for us for quite a while now, for nearly six years, um, and you know, we continue to, to come up with new and exciting ways of waking ourselves up in the middle of the night. Um, so you know, it, it, it's continuously uh, aided us in our journey. And, and then the final thing that I will implore is use existing tools that you already have as you make these transitions. It's so appealing to just find this cool new thing and be like, I'm going to install this and I'm going to use this thing. We, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the room is administrators. Use the things you know first and then look at the cool and exciting stuff. And that trend, Sensu's flexibility has really, really helped us there too. So um, I think that's all I have. I wrapped that up way quicker than I expected to. Um, so thank you very much and any questions? Yeah, Lee, that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> While questions come to mind, please yeah, come on up. I'll, I'll mention that the, the person you referred to, the blog post that went into great detail in Kubernetes and how they set it up is out of a, it's, he's out of Amsterdam and wasn't able to fly in for this. Okay. But yeah, you two should definitely connect. I, yeah, uh, Andy, yeah, I read that Andy blog post and I was like, this is way better than what I've got. So, <laughs> um. No, and I think that's something that we're acknowledging. There's a lot of like, little clusters of people that just haven't gotten a chance to meet each other and connect on how they're putting, um, putting Kubernetes and Sensu together in production. Uh, so we're really looking forward to, like one of the takeaways of this show for me is to find you, introduce each other, and like let's, let's start uh, powwowing on how to do that effectively. Sure. But go to questions. Yeah, so it feels like there's a, a number of really interesting integration points Kubernetes would have with Sensu from um, you know, simple stuff like where you've got your readiness and liveness checks to maybe even using annotations and uh, admission controllers to automatically inject sidecars. What are, the, what are the things you're interested in around there that you'd like to see with, say, Sensu 2.0? I, I think that you mentioned it there. The, the, the liveness checks is a really, really useful component. And it, it's, it's not actually useful for me. It's really useful for the application developers because having something that fixes their application when a liveness check fails is great, but then having a monitoring system that tells them that happened and having that bundled automatically is a really, really big deal. And you mentioned it again, like actually having um, 
There, there's a bunch of stuff out there. I didn't want to make this too in-depth, um, but there's a bunch of stuff out there that means that your developer doesn't even need to compile this manifest. You can automatically inject that sidecar with a Sensu client in there um, and give the ability for the, de for the developer to not even think about it. They don't even need to know anymore that how to monitor their system. All they need to do is expose this endpoint with a bunch of Prometheus metrics, and then the automation take care of the rest. So that's definitely something that where um, I am all in favor of waking up developers instead of me. Um, so okay. anything that helps me do that will be warmly received. Hi. Uh, first off, uh, excellent presentation. By the way, I would love to, to listen to the complete, more in-depth presentation. If you have a link or let me know, <clears throat> uh, yeah, first absolutely. and foremost. Um, you mentioned metrics, right? So uh, maybe I just missed it, but um, are you guys doing anything with respect to persistent storage? Maybe you can look, light a little bit of color on that. If you guys doing the back end, do you save your met metrics? Do you, are you guys doing anything with respect to time series analysis? And second question is with alerting. Is there anything you guys uh, do in terms of managing the work alerting? Do you, did you implement a workflow with other systems? Or? Um, so the first question um, to answer that around metrics, we don't use sensor for metrics at all. Um, so we previously used uh, Collect D, uh, sorry, uh, Diamond, the Python collector, and Graphite. And then we've transitioned most of our metric checks to Prometheus because it gives you that ability to um, you know, do uh, predictive failures, it does things like trend analysis and all that kind of stuff, and it's just much more uh, our kind of like thought process around um, failures with metrics. Um, so um, I, I could do a whole other talk on that. Um, the second question around workflow, um, it, it's, um, I am aware that this is being um, filmed and my InfoSec team is quite um, nervous about this talk, so I would prefer to take that offline if that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very fair point. Other questions? Kubernetes people? Well, I, one that came to mind for me, so you're just saying that like you, you'd love to wake devs up at night as opposed to, to you. So um, if your team would be comfortable with you saying it, like how big is your, your group that's managing this, this monitoring solution and how open are your devs to being w woken up in the night? Um, so there's only three people that work on our Kubernetes platform full time, um, which I think is um, in, says enough about um, how um, much management and overhead that you need to put into this kind of stuff. Um, our devs are very reluctant to be woken up, but we just do it anyway. So um, they are all in pager duty, and if their thing fails, we wake them up, and um, we do it automatically, and it's not my problem. Um, so. You know, like any software, um, you know, culture, there is a um, a transition there as well, and we, you know, you could have a whole other conversation around how monitoring can actually drive the culture in your company. Um, and and you know, one of the things that we have noticed as we've moved towards a more service-based monitoring approach is that. Um, your developers have to be on board with, with being woken up. And if they're not on board, you have to wake them up anyway. Because at the end of the day, you only need to pay someone who can fix the problem. And it's probably not you. Um, so, you know, it, 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 I, I do believe, and one of the things that, you know, I've talked about before is monitoring drives the culture in your company. Like, who is responsible for problems can drive that, that, that conversation. And what was great for us is Sensu's flexibility. Uh, you know, I know that Yelp, and I don't know if there's anyone from Yelp here, but I know that Yelp have done some really fantastic things with their uh, monitoring handlers and automatically paging certain teams and all that kind of stuff. And we've just essentially followed their lead. Um, so, you know, I, I'd, be, I'd love to have conversations later today or tomorrow about that as well. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, let's give them a round of applause for a great Thank presentation. You.